and start the share. All right, good morning, everyone. This is our virtual uh, technical assistance meeting. So you'll uh, get everything that we did in our face-to-face -face meetings and you'll have the opportunity to uh, answer questions. So hopefully everybody that's on this call is interested in uh, putting in an application for 21st century. And then uh, we'll be able to answer any of your questions. All right, so let's get started. So first of all, this is considered to be a model program. We give you uh, federal funding to create a wonderful after-school program. And uh, then we're, we'll also, we're gonna talk about uh, our timeline, the DE website. Uh, we'll talk about some changes in the application. We'll talk about community partners. We'll talk about monitoring tools, risk assessment. And we'll talk about uh, things you shouldn't be doing, should be doing with data. Um, we'll give you some application tips and we'll talk about what's expected of you. Okay, so this is considered a model program. And um, as such, um, a lot of the requirements are that you provide information to the public, to your community. Um, after you've been in operation for a year, you'll be doing a local evaluation that we require you to post. Uh, we'd like you to have um, an advisory group for within your community to help you guide this grant. And uh, we report data to Congress and we collect that data three times a year. This is the only federal title program that is competitive, which means you must apply for funding. It's not automatic like Title I where everybody uh, just gets some if you're a school district. And another unique thing is this is also open to community groups, hence the title, 21st Century Community Learning Centers. Uh, funding is determined by your performance data and a peer review process, um, and by following all the rules, laws, and statutes for the program. Um, <clears throat> now, you uh, may have a high score, but you may have violated some rule or federal statute and you didn't get funded. Um, or you may have a low score because our reviewers, um, you know, uh, didn't think that uh, your proposal was worth funding. So those are two things that can affect you in this process. But the odds are pretty good. Um, about half of the people that apply receive funding. And those are pretty good odds. Now this program can change lives. It's focused on helping children in poverty and um, with the community, you can make some, some big differences in their lives. Um, we expect results in this program and a good quality program should be able to do the following, increase attendance, reduce referrals to the office, and in, over time, increase student achievement in reading and math. It's a lot of work, but it's worth it when you're when you know you're changing lives. Here's a timeline, and this just kind of shows you the process in uh, in one graphic. Right now, we are in the um, the application webinar part, which is on the top line. We still have. Uh, to collect the grant, and it's due on Friday the 13th in December by four o'clock. And we'll have a peer review process, and then we'll announce our awards, and then you'll get started with the awards. Okay, here's the uh, timeline. And this is taken right off the department website. All of these things have already happened. We're now on the December 7th uh, webinar. Um, next week, the letters of intent must be submitted via an online form. And then again, December 13th, the grant is due. Um, a lot of people 
work to the last minute and they're driving down to Des Moines to get it in by four o'clock. Um, it's a good idea to try to get it in early because um, if the post office delivers it Monday, um, you didn't make the deadline. You know, they all have services that'll get it, you know, overnight. So you may need to spend the extra to get it to us on time. The uh, week after the application, we'll, we spent a couple of days going through to make sure you have everything you need to have. And then we give a couple of months for our reviewers to read and score your application. And then after that, um, I'm required to do a, an additional review, but my review is on the statutes and the, the requirements. You know, there's a state law that says we have to have a minority impact statement. If you don't have it, I can't give you a dime. So make sure you get all those required forms in. All of our programs will start July 1 with the state fiscal year. So here's where we were around the state three locations, eastern, western, and central part of Iowa. Um, here's a little bit of our funding. It's been pretty good. We've been getting a little bit more. Um, so it's been a pretty stable funding stream. Now, we require an electronic copy of the grant and all the forms and uh, we'll accept a CD and, or a flash drive. Um, you, you can try to send it via email, but you know, um, everybody has these filters and sometimes I may not get the email. Uh, you're responsible to make sure that I receive that on electronic copy, so. Um, Flash drives are usually the easiest. Um, everybody has an old flash drive, you know, laying around. Maybe uh, you lost the, the nice cover. You can send that one in. It usually doesn't take much space to send this information to us. Okay, another important thing is direct all your questions to me, vicjaris at iowa.gov. Uh, the application is mailed to my secretary who date stamps and verifies that we have received the application, but she does not answer questions. So I might as well go straight to me because if you email her and ask a question, um, she will forward that email to me. So this grant is for at-risk kids. We expect that you're going to operate about three hours a day, five days a week. And <clears throat> provide some services for kids that'll help them improve attendance, improve behavior, improve their reading, and uh, improve their math. And all of these will be reported three times a year in the federal APR system. This is the Department of Education website address. It's uh, educateiowa.gov. And to get to 21st century, you click on the A to Z index, go down to the number two, and then you should bookmark that site because you'll probably be um, going back there because we've got a lot of stuff there posted online. And then if you scroll down, you're gonna see the uh, application materials. And we have a lot of documents to help you have a successful application. And make sure that you look at those documents and don't just grab the application and fill that out and you know think you're done uh, because it'll it'll be reflected in what you provide if you don't look at that guidance. So uh, peer reviewers are going to score your application. They're going to determine the potential quality of a program based on your narrative. Then after that, I'm going to look at it 
but I'm only going to look at the highest score. So if you got, you know, 100 points, uh, there's a good chance I'm going to look at yours right away. I go by the highest score first and down the line by rank. And until I run out of money. So you may have a score that's pretty good. It's an 85, but I ran out of money at 95. Dick, it looks like on the, um, the presentation, mm -hmm. your slides aren't changing. Really? So, They're changing on mine? Yeah, on your share, it's not changing anything. Oh. Maybe I need to do it this way. There, now it's changing. OK. So maybe just stay in that yeah. view. OK. Uh, another important point is if you're awarded, that doesn't improve everything in your application. You still have to follow the rules. Um, I may not catch everything if there's something in there that uh, should be changed. So the burden as you, is on you to follow the rules and the burden is on you to contact me if you have anything that uh, you think might be a, a rule violation or any potential problem because that way we'll get everything fixed and things won't magnify. Okay. So right on the application, we've got, if you're a non-compliant stop, you're not eligible, and we've got the federal code citation. Um, and we have, you know, a lot of federal rules that govern our application. Uh, the second one is 40% minimum free and reduced lunch by building. So um, it kind of breaks my heart sometimes when, you know, I get a, an email from a building that was over 40% and now they've dropped below. Um, let's say, for example, you have 50% free and reduced lunch. You got an application, you had a program going for five years and you want to reapply, but your free and reduced lunch dropped below 40, it dropped down to 38. I cannot fund any program um, that is not at 40%. Now, those are federal statutory rules and uh, you know we cannot violate those rules. So um, monitor your free and reduced lunch numbers every year when they come out at, from the department and make sure that you have a meeting every year when the, you know, parents are coming in registering their kids, you get them to sign up for the free and reduced lunch because we want you to be eligible. Okay, contact time, three hours a day, five days a week. Iowa is not an ELT state. We require 60 hours a month, which is almost 600 hours of contact time a year. Uh, and this meets a research standard for academic progress for kids based on the Wallace Foundation. Like I said, we want you to succeed and um, this is just the minimum. Uh, pro, some programs are doing more than 60 hours a month and they have even higher results. Now, keep in mind, for example, in December, there's going to be a Christmas break if you're a school. So you just take the days that the school is open and you would take three hours a day times how many days school is actually open. If you get a snow day, we don't count that against you either. Remember, school has to be open um, for that day to count. So some months won't be 60 hours. You know, December is not 60 hours. Spring break, you get another week off. It's not 60 hours in that month either, okay? We wanna be fair. In the application, you may have seen some highlighted areas. We try to do every year is when we make changes to highlight that so that our folks can see what's new at a glance. Okay, this year we uh, added some change in the rubric. We uh, in order to comply with ESSA, we added a measure of effectiveness and uh, we also added a um, 
parent engagement section in the rubric. So that resulted in an extra page to the application and extra points. Last year, uh, we had fewer available points than this year, and that's because we um, expanded a little bit that application. <clears throat> And here are some code citations. Down at the bottom, you can see that, uh, you know, why we, we have renewability. That's one of the things that I have to oversee. This year, we've got some bonus points. Um, we've got, if you're in a county with more than 18% child poverty, you can get an additional five points. Now, you have to look it up on this website, um, and we provide the link. So, you know, um, if you didn't, if you don't have 18% based on this website, don't try to claim the points. Some more bonus points is if you're a rural community, and the census defines rural as under 2,499 people. And also, we provide the link to the census data. And then finally, the one we've had for many years, and that is if you are designated uh, comprehensive, which used to be priority, or targeted, which used to be needs improvement, then uh, that school, as long as you're partnered with a community partner, can receive an additional five points. And you can look up your school designation on a brand new department website. It's Iowa School Performance, and we've got the link there. Now, um, charging fees is not considered a best practice. And so this year, you know, the reviewers, if you say you're going to charge fees, you might lose some points. They might say, hey, you know, that's not the best program. Uh, for one, this program is targeting kids in poverty. We provide um, a decent amount of funding and you're required to create community partnerships for sustainability. Um, a few years ago, um, people thought that charging fees was a way to sustain the program and it's uh, just a small amount of money. If you have community partners, they can provide funding but it's a little more work on the applicant side. And I think eventually with changes in the federal statutes, fees are going to go away. That's the sense that I've got from many meetings. And so I try to keep you guys aware of the changes that are happening in this program and let you know um, as far in advance as I possibly can. Uh, there are other states that have already banned charging fees, but Iowa, we are still keeping with the uh, statute. And there is the statute on uh, charging fees. Um, you can't prohibit any family from participating, and so you have to offer scholarships. And if you charge fees, um, we have more hoops for you to jump through. Every year, um, you're gonna to have to keep track of your program income. We've got a special spreadsheet for that. The few dollars you get from those families that are in poverty um, count against your program. Um, however, if you get a community partner, for example, like John Deere, and they wanna give you $10,000, that does not count as program income. There's also a, a, a website that we have available that you'll have to um, submit your enrollment form for review every year. Here's a look at that special spreadsheet for those folks that charge fees um, that you'll have to be keeping track and submitting that to the department for review. So it's not a best practice. You're probably a lot better off to not charge the fees. And then when I come out to visit, I'm going to ask you for a list of every single student and their status and 
I'll review who's been paying fees and what is um, sad is, you know, a lot of times I, I see these lists and um, people that should have been getting the program for free have been charged a fee and you'll have to issue a refund in that case. So, all right, let's move on. Um, this is my favorite part of the ESSA. Um, and that is for us to provide the least restrictive and burdensome regulations for you in this program. I know for some of you that are new, it does not seem that way. Um, but keep in mind, this is a federal program. Those of you that have been doing this for a while can maybe remember when the application was 120 pages. And we've been working on bringing that down and uh, it's a constant struggle to try to keep things manageable as far as all the, the regulations. Okay, the next one is our wonderful federal data collection system, the APR. And there's the code citation that uh, allows us to collect that data. And this is just an example of what it looks like. It's fairly easy to use. And here's a little timeline of major data reporting. Year one, you don't do a local evaluation because we're a year behind. Year two, you'll do your first local evaluation and then you'll be also three times a year putting data into the APR system. Then uh, year four, same thing, year five. Year six, you won't actually have funding but you're year five local evaluation is due because it's always a year behind. So keep that in mind when you're planning that you have that um, arranged with your evaluator to do that final year. Okay, partners are required. You're, you must have a minimum of five. And on the surface that might seem like a burden, but you know, we've got this year a list posted of 780 partners online, and that's our URL to our list. It's on the Iowa After School Alliance website. It's also linked off the department page. And I put uh, over 30 statewide partners on that list myself. So um, it's not a burden to ask you to have five. And we expect that number to grow as you move forward in your grant. Keep in mind, the name of this grant, 21st Century Community Learning Centers. Okay, literacy resources. Reading is our state priority in the grant. And so we expect you to make progress with kids reading. Libraries make great partners, especially when it comes to literacy. Here's some wonderful resources for you to take advantage of. We've got a list of every library in the state. We've, uh, we're partnered with the Iowa Ag Literacy Foundation, Iowa Reading Research Center, <coughs> and you can get Iowa authors to visit your, your schools. You're also required to have a partnership with a community college for adult literacy. These colleges get federal funds to provide adult literacy. And by partnering with them, we avoid supplanting. Uh, plus, all of these colleges are great places to recruit volunteers. There's pre-service teachers, there's college students. Um, that maybe you need to do community service, or maybe you want to even hire a college student at less money than you would pay uh, a teacher to do something like physical education in your program. So these are opportunities for your program to grow. Um, there's the Iowa directory. And here's just a, a few of the hundreds of partners we have listed online. 
Now, after your first year, you're going to start sending us your list of partners. Because we monitor this, it's a requirement of the grant. When I come to visit on a site visit, I'll want to meet with your community partners. This is how we help kids by creating these partnerships within the community. You know, there's a lot of community groups, but this grant helps bring everybody together instead of everybody doing their own thing. Here's an example of the value of partnerships in Iowa. We're serving 17,000 kids and 21st century federal funds only paid for 11,000. So that means over 5,000 kids are, are being get, provided a program because of their communities. And if you take that value of pro, in terms of a program per year, that's like an extra two years of federal funding that we're generating locally to serve kids. And that's just fantastic. Um, also, we don't use letters of support. We require a memorandum of understanding, an MOU, and that MOU should have what kind of services provided, how long it's gonna provide it, talk about how many staff, the days, the hours, and uh, that should all be in there. And we have a template for that to make it even easier for you. We also have some required percentages. Um, we limit local evaluation to 4%. And that has done a lot to keep some of these out-of-state sharks uh, out of our fish tank. Um, I've had superintendents call me and that's when we put up this warning. Uh, these guys would be calling them and saying, yeah, we'll rent this grant for you for free. And then they, they'd send them a contract and yeah, they wanted uh, them to take 30% of their grant to buy their free, buy some product from one of their partners. And then they wanted 10 to 15% for evaluation. Um, since we have a template, it makes it pretty easy to do the local evaluation. And we have had, you know, no pushback from local evaluators that have done this for, you know, many years. Okay, we always start with the grant on the line with the fiscal year, which means July 1. And in the past, we did advance payments, but, you know, we had a meeting with our rural schools who we thought needed the money and they said no it's we really don't need that advance payment and so to reduce the uh, regulations and paperwork we got rid of that advance payment making everybody's life a little bit less encumbered we provide a checklist in the application to help you uh, stay on track um, these are some things that we need to know and just telling you this up front helps you to get organized and helps us to monitor what we need to monitor. We have two uh, official monitoring uh, mechanisms and they're posted online on the department website. They're, the first visit is an 11 page checklist and that's the first one. Uh, we'll go through that to make sure you're doing all the things that are required by statute. Uh, then there's a second visit that I usually do year three before your funding gets reduced, and that'll be a series of meetings where we will talk with all the stakeholders, uh, talk with parents, community partners, the school principal, um, administration, and even the kids, and uh, the staff and we'll make sure that you're on track to continue the grant. <clears throat> we have a lot of things on there to help you with your application. We have a spreadsheet to help you with a base estimate. And this is what it looks like.
And because it's a federal grant, we have a minimum amount that we can do. And it kind of breaks my heart sometimes because a small rural school sometimes will email me and they say, um, we're using the spreadsheet and it says we're not fundable. And I, you know, get their data and I says, no, you just don't have enough kids. We can't give you an award. So uh, what they could do is, you know, partner with um, another district to get enough kids for the federal minimums. Okay, um, you're going to need to watch your percentages in your budget. Valuation is 4%. Professional development, no less than 5%. So the key to work, getting kids to make progress is good professional development. Train your staff with literacy strategies. Train them in social-emotional learning. And it's going to pay big dividends in reaching kids. The next one is access. Up to 8% can be spent for issues of safety, uh, providing maybe a tutor if you need one. Um, then finally, administrative costs, and that's up to 8%, and that includes any uh, indirect costs. So um, some people may have like a school district rate of 4%, um, that is considered administrative, so keep that in mind. Again, the federal minimum is 50000 and the maximum is 300000 per application year, and you have to justify that with the numbers of kids. You know, if you've got 50 kids and you're asking for 300000 um, you probably will not get 300000 this is very important. You must consult with private and non-public school officials during the design and development. We have a form for that. It's a statutory requirement of the grant. And you must include that form for us to process your application. Um, we already have this in schools with Title I because that's money where the uh, non-publics get equitable participation, and that's true with this one too. So I'm going to review those, and you know, you should have met all of these um, rules. And I've even included the statute for your reference. Um, these are questions you need to ask your non-public. Which children are going to get the benefit? Uh, how will the kids' needs be identified? What benefits will be provided? How will benefits be provided? And how will the project be evaluated? So they have to agree to provide you data and evaluation um, it, to participate. They don't just get the money and they don't share data with you and they don't participate. Okay, um, the benefits are organized in comparable benefits to what you're doing in your program, the exact same benefits in your program or different benefits. That's something for you guys to handle locally. Your consultation form should be completed in October, September and October, not December, the first two or three days before the grant was due. Um, you're supposed to also include the who you talked with, their contact, names, phone numbers, emails, the dates of your meeting, the outcome of your meeting. Sometimes I get a form and it's blank. Um, you need to have an outcome. Are they going to participate and, you know, give us some information? And we now have someone at the department who oversees all these. So if I find something that uh, is insufficient, I will be re, uh, working with the, our non-public person at the department. So new applications, you can get a three-year grant at 100% for three years. And then if you pass your um, site visits, you may receive an additional two years at 75%. And the reason is you are required for sustain to develop sustainability in your communities. Um, and that 25% since I've been doing this has not been an issue with anyone. Um, so we can't extend any grant beyond a five year, that's the statute. And we must document sustainability. So we've got forms that we 
require and we'll be constantly working with you to help you uh, develop partners. So the two visits, the first one is between year one and three and it's you know, an 11 page checklist. Then after that, there's a site visit where it's a series of meetings. These forms are posted on the department website. They're posted on the IAA website. Um, it's public knowledge. I don't want you to have a surprise to say, oh, I didn't know you were checking on this. We've even incorporated a lot of these site visit elements in the rubric because we want you to succeed. And if you do these things that, are, that we check on, you will have a good program. And also, I have to do risk assessment on everyone. That's a requirement for this grant. <clears throat> and uh, sustainability is a requirement. And if you don't document your past sustainability or write your grant like, like you know, in the correct way to incorporate what your partners are contributing, it could be considered supplanting. And that's not good that could keep your grant from being funded. Okay, let's talk about partnerships. Partnerships defined as an entity that makes contributions to your grant goals and outcomes. And you should be having regular meetings with your partners, at least quarterly. Now, some of you that want the five extra points, you know, you might have a jointly submitted application. And, um, you know, that should not be an organization that you're just contracted with. You need to be having regular meetings and they should be, you know, contributing more than just signing a piece of paper for you. So, we must have evidence to have an eligible partnership that um, you've got an MOU and you can use vendors, for example, um, 4-H Club, you know, they, they don't have a lot of funding and, you know, they have to charge a fee and they're a good partner. However, there are others that, that do absolutely nothing without a fee and when your money gets reduced, uh, you may not be able to have them in your program anymore. So. Keep those things in mind as you're working on your budgets and thinking long term. Um, thank you. Each partner organization has roles that they play in your, your program. You have meetings, they'll help you with evaluation. Um, some of them will provide um, training for your program. Um, they might provide field trips, enrichment activities. Make sure that you have your partners in your budget. And this year we've added a form D3, which gives you a five year budget to help you with partner contributions. Now, we don't need the five years and we don't expect that's gonna be filled out for five years when you turn it in. We just expect that year one is completed when you turn that in. So, community partners, the community colleges are great ones and you know, you can bring them for an adult uh, parent engagement meeting and they can have a table and talk about all the classes they offer adults. And <clears throat> like I said, the colleges have a separate federal grant that they use to provide those adult literacy courses. Okay, uh, you know, with all federal grants, we need to supplement and not supplant. And so there's several tests. Number one, um, is the program 
required by a state federal law. If it is, then it's supplanting. Um, there was a couple years ago, uh, the state had a, a law about providing uh, summer school for kids for literacy. So what we did in our program is we just said, well, whatever date the school district provides for literacy, we will start our summer program after that date and provide additional days for literacy training for those children. Have to be careful that we're adding on and having, you know, making sure that it's a supplement. And I did get a few that asked, oh, can we use the federal funds to pay for that state required literacy? And the answer is, of course, no. Uh, the second test is equivalency. Were state or local funds used in the past to pay for the activity? And if they were, it is supplanting. You might have a school that's run an after school program, but they could only afford two days a week. They want to now apply for these federal funds, and they can but they must keep their two day a week program going. Um, they can now expand that program to five days a week and add, offer it out to additional kids. So that way we are supplementing and not supplanting. The third test, non-title programs. Are the same programs being run in other schools that do not receive these funds and are these paid for with state or local funds? Um, so if you have any questions, contact me on this. I don't want you to you know, get into an entanglement. And of course you can't use federal funds to backfill. Backfilling is like, let's say you have a position of somebody that's uh, you know, an assistant director and all of a sudden you get these federal funds and you say, boy, we're gonna pay this salary out of that. No, um, you can pay a portion based on the actual time worked in the grant out of that, but you cannot just wholesale take an entire salary and pay for it out of this program like that. Okay, here's an example. <clears throat> Community partner in previous grants said it would contribute 15,000 in services. New grant application, you list this, person, this group as a partner, but they don't disclose any contributions. So that's uh, an example of supplanting. Evidence of supplanting can render the best application unfundable. And here's something that hopefully we, you know, we don't have a problem with, but I'm required to share this information with you. Uh, federal grant fraud is very serious. The two things I think that we might encounter <clears throat> would be false statements and false claims. Okay, um, according to the Office of Inspector General, grant fraud is defined as falsifying information in your application um, or using funds to purchase items that are not for the use of the grant, billing for more than one grant, that doing the same work, billing for expenses not incurred, billing for work never performed, falsifying test results, substituting approved materials with unauthorized products or misrepresenting a project status to continue to receive federal funds. So that's good food for thought as we move forward. Here's another example. Um, application reported there were no non-public schools within the boundary. However, we discovered a non-public school block away. <clears throat> no con consultation was made and false information was provided in the application. Another example, your grant wanted to provide adult literacy services in cooperation with a local community college. However, you build the grant for the same services that the college provided. Not good. Another example, <coughs> excuse me. A program bills for expenses to repair a copy machine. Copy machine was purchased with other funds. Um, another example, your grant application reported serving 400 kids. You failed 
to report an attendance problem and you actually are serving only 100. So all of these kinds of things um, can get you into trouble. There's also an Iowa Code, Chapter 685 on false claims. It was enacted in 2010. So, you know, this is a serious issue. And so we've got federal statute, we've got Iowa law um, to make sure that when you put this stuff down, you're providing us with, you know, honest and factual information. Now, according to the feds, they think that uh, grant fraud can occur even if you uh, never got an award just by provi providing uh, false information on an application. So it's a pretty serious thing. Um, I, the biggest thing that I, I think that um, could get us into trouble is the free and reduced lunch numbers. And like I said, we have a spreadsheet that's linked in the application. Make sure you're going by that. Don't report any other number. The penalties for, you know, grant fraud are severe. Um, Now, with that being said, 99% of all of our non-compliance issues are resolved within five days. People contact me, um, I will say, how can we work this out? And we'll come up with a solution quickly. So we don't let this get to be a big issue, but I am required uh, to provide you with this information and warnings. <clears throat> okay, so, that's pretty good that 99% are resolved five, within five days via email or a phone call. And if it, we don't resolve it, then you have 30 days um, to resolve it informally. After 30 days, it's gonna become a formal issue and I will bring in our compliance officer at the IDO, at Iowa Department of Education and the program officer at the federal level. So just food for thought. What's expected of you? Number one, to serve the needs of kids. Quality programs will do this. They'll increase attendance, reduce referrals to the office, and improve reading and math scores. We've got tons of data that says, yes, this is what happens. So if you're not able to do this, then you're, there's something wrong with your program plan that needs to be revised so that you can do this. You also need to maintain a web page to post your evaluation and uh, develop and cultivate community partners over time. Um, every month you should be looking at your budget. Every quarter you can submit claims and we allow you to manage your budget. Um, we let you make line item adjunct adjustments. So we have um, two financial deadlines and the, the biggest one is the um, school, the state fiscal year, which we need for the claims by August 15th. However, we're using online systems and they wanna get those wrapped up by July 15th. So um, hopefully if, that won't be a problem, but if you need an extension, you know, I can certainly grant that. Okay, budget tips. <clears throat> Use that spreadsheet and then also include your contributions from your partners. And uh, don't just ask for the maximum ward size unless you've got the numbers to justify it. Pay attention to the allowable percentages. Make sure that, you know, you've got um, a good budget. We like you to spend 100% of your award every year. Um, most of the time that happens, but sometimes um, people don't. Okay, here are the different sections of the grant. 
student needs assessment, academic goals, enrichment. Um, <clears throat> Then we have uh, the research base and evaluation. Now here are the different areas where I see points are, are lost. You know, I get a lot of emails on these five bonus points. People want that extra five points and they um, tend to neglect these big point sections. The project narrative used to be 20 and now it's 24 points. I would suggest you make sure that you've got that well written so you get all the points there. Uh, followed by the student needs assessment and the management plan. Right there, that's 64 points. Those are the areas where you need to pay a lot of attention. Another tip for success. Um, provide accurate information, but have someone outside your organization take a look and read your application before you submit it to us. And, you know, they might have some questions that maybe you didn't quite uh, make something clear in your narrative. Document the needs that you have with your kids, double check your budget, and don't go over the page limits. <clears throat> Now, if you get an award, we expect you to participate in one committee for each cohort. And we have an evaluation committee, a PD committee, a support committee, a communications committee, and a family engagement committee. So um, you have your choice. And these are led by direct program directors in the field so that we can better help you succeed in your programs. Okay, now we'll, let's open it up for questions. David asks, is this available or will the PowerPoint be made available to get the earlier slides? Oh, I'll, yeah, we'll put the PowerPoint up. Of course, we always put the PowerPoints up. 